Hello and welcome to the rise and fall of the Girl Boss, part of the Women with a Movie Camera Summit. I'm joined today by three powerhouse panelists. Today I have with me three broadcasters and film critics, Ashanti Omka. Hi, Ashanti. Hello. Hi. I have Mary Ann uh, Johansson with me. Hi, Mary Ann. Hi. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming. And we have Leila Latif. Hi. Very excited for this chat. Fantastic. Three astounding girl bosses to talk about a very fitting subject. Now, when I think of a girl boss, I think of glamour. I think of an untouchable and assertive woman in film. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I'd like to hear from yourselves who for you was the original movie girl boss. Could I start with you, Marianne? Well, I might go with Tess McGill from Working Girl, which I think is from long before we even started using the idea girl boss or had come up with the name for it. But I love how she is. Uh, she's so confident. She's assertive, and she's navigating um, a work environment, literally a work environment, uh, that does not want her there and does not welcome her style of of managing. Partly because she has to fake it. <laughs> but yeah, she'd be my original. The original girl boss. How about you, Leila? Well, I suppose for like as a millennial, the one that kind of was the formative experience for me was Miranda Priestley from A Double Prada. That sort of you know, monstrous alpha female who um, is uh, completely in charge and can make people kind of, you know, fall to their knees by just pursing her lips. I love that. A cock of the eyebrow and mm. Roman crumble, a, a perfect girl boss. And how about you, Ashanti? I also have to go with, with Marianne on this one because working girl, I think for, for many of us, especially for me, I was always almost groomed by my parents to be aspiring to be in the corporate world. And it's exactly what I did with my life before what I do now. And Working Girl was that, that kind of epitome of a woman who's seeking this, who has to go through a lot of loops in order to, to kind of achieve those ambitions. And I think she, she, she did it so well. And it's no wonder that she, you know, she had a nomination for Best Actress, et cetera, et cetera. At the Oscars, it, it just really worked for me. And it was very inspirational. And maybe it's a sign of, sign of my times as well, because as a child, I was looking at a film like that as you know, apart from my Barbie, I had a, a, a girl, a girl Barbie, well, all, all Barbies are girls, but this was a, a Barbie doll that turned from day to night. And I'd asked my parents to buy it for me because she had this really fancy costume with, uh, with the stilettos for the, for the evening. And in the daytime, she wore a power suit and working girl and that this all kind of fitted for me. And it's something I really aspired to. And I'm glad I, I did it with my life at some point. I like that. And we've instantly drawn two parallels. We've got the kind of noble, ambitious girl boss. And then we've got the nefarious girl boss. There's two, it feels very binary. And I wanted to draw, especially on Miranda Priestley and some recent examples that we've seen in cinema of the girl boss. I'm thinking of Rosamund Pike in I Care A Lot and also Emma Thompson in Cruella, which is the Disney film, which most recently came out. And these women I mean, it, it was mentioned in the event description for this. They're the women that we, in quotations, love to hate. They're nefarious, they're invariably insecure underneath the layers of, of kind of this, this pompous and superior attitude. And I wondered why do you think that these women in, in high positions of power are created to come across that way? Leila, if I could start with you as, as Miranda was your go-to gal boss. God, yeah, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? Because like, it's, we're kind of presented with these characters and they are villainous in so many respects, but we as the audience are still supposed to find them quite empowering. And it's like that there's something kind of innate in womanhood that you sort of project onto them, like, oh, the struggles that they must have gone to to get to this point. So even someone like Emma Thompson in Cruella, who is literally a murderer, <laughs> like a serial, a serial murderer, then we're still supposed to feel that she, she's fabulous. She's fabulous. Isn't it incredible that she's kind of accomplished so much and is kind of reigns over everyone around her. And I think that's where the kind of murkiness of the girl boss comes in because are we saying that success for this character sort of excuses some of their actions because you know they had to be ruthless to get where they are um but yeah it's a very very uh complicated topic which i guess is why we're all here to discuss it 
<laughs> exactly. Marianne, how, how do you feel about that, about this, this kind of counter girl boss to, to the one that you've described? And why do you think that these women are portrayed in that way? Uh, well, I think one of the things is that as soon as the term girl boss started to be used, it, there's almost a negative connotation to it. It is that she, she's cruel. She's not a nice boss. She's not a nice person. Um, and maybe that has something to do with the fact that feminism always goes in waves. And uh, Ashanti and I are talking about Working Girl, and Tess was very much a positive role model. That movie had a, a negative boss in the Sigourney Weaver character, but she was not the focus of the film. And I don't think anybody thought she was amazing, even at the time. Uh, but yeah, I, I think maybe it's because now the pendulum is swinging the other way again and people are starting, to, our culture is starting to be a little suspicious or, and look down on women who are too powerful, um, too authoritative. And for me, the term girl, girl boss like is mostly has negative connotations. I, like I don't, the idea that we're supposed to see Emma Thompson in Cruella as, as glamorous and interesting and exciting kind of appalls me. I mean, of course she's an, as a character, she's amazing and Emma Thompson is incredible. But the idea that, that anybody should be wanting to emulate her is kind of upsetting. How do you feel about it, Ashanti? Uh, I, I echo a lot of what uh, Leila and Marianne have said. For me, I, I love the term girl boss. I actually used it as a hashtag very recently on one of my social posts. It's one that I feel I've always reclaimed and I, I, I love, love that term. But I do hate the way it's portrayed in mass media as a whole because a lot of these characters seem to be coming from the minds of men who don't like women to be assertive. So I have heard this said to me several times from various corporations, from sitting in boardrooms in my corporate life to the media world where I've been told I'm too assertive. You're coming across as, you know, too aggressive. That's a word that they use a lot. And they don't like it. The minute you start opening up and saying what you need to say, and they don't like what, what you're saying, they will just throw that back on you. And that mirrors so much in cinema, it mirrors so much in television, in the characters. And I wonder how many of the production companies and the producers of these films are insisting, like in Indian cinema, the producers have a lot of say in how well, characters are portrayed in films, which is not necessarily the case in, in Hollywood, for example. But a lot of the time, these people who are bankrolling these films don't want to see the good, the good women, <laughs> the ones who are bosses, who are getting the job done and doing it really well. So I feel that that is a bit of an issue. And I think that we need to keep working on it because like you mentioned in, in I Care A Lot, you know, I personally, I just thought, whoa, I just, you know, I know she's doing bad things, but I absolutely love how she's doing it. And the fact that she's out there doing it. And I feel that, that women who are portrayed in, in that kind of bad way are the ones that are getting a lot of attraction. And where are we and why are we not seeing more of those, those, those good women is, is the question. And I grew up on, on TV shows like Girlfriends and you know, in that Tracy Ellis Ross, her character, you know, she was a girl boss. And those are the sort of things that shaped me and what I wanted to be. But I've had a pushback from men all the time. It's never been from a woman. It's always been from a, a guy in power who has not liked what I'm saying. So this is what they're mirroring and echoing in, in cinema and television, sadly. Yeah, absolutely. Marianne, you, you mentioned that feminism moves in waves and we can certainly pinpoint the depiction of the girl boss on screen in kind of correlation with that. But I wonder, is it a trope that charts back even further than the times we're talking about? Does it, does it chart back to sort of classic Hollywood, would you say? Well, sure. I mean, you have all sorts of glamorous, uh, bitchy women, you know, going all the way back to, you know, the earliest golden age comedies and musicals and all. Um, but I, I don't think they're not, they weren't depicted quite the same way. Um, they maybe weren't literally bosses in the way that we see characters now, like they weren't financially successful, uh, unless they had inherited money, maybe. Um, I think maybe the difference now is what kind of what uh, tying in with what Ashanti was just saying is that the, uh, a woman who is powerful and authoritative but isn't mean, isn't cruel, and is actually getting good things done, that's a real challenge to our status quo today. You know, the woman who is powerful but nasty and cruel, that sort of just ties into stereotypes about, you know, why women shouldn't have power. And um, 
yeah, why maybe they shouldn't be allowed to have these positions. So, but yeah, I think that we've always had these kinds of women. It's how the films are depicting them and how we respond to them as a culture, not just individually. Yeah, absolutely. Leila, how about yourself? Are there any sort of women in classic Hollywood who have spoken to you on a level where you've perceived them to be authoritative? Or, I mean, it's interesting because you can also take it off the screen slightly and look at women who navigated through the star system as well, who we could, you know, you look back at like Barbara Stanwyck and and you see that these girl bosses existed in real life. I was wondering if if there are any examples that struck you from kind of classic Hollywood. Well, yeah, I mean, as much as like, you know, technically Scarlett O'Hara is kind of a girl boss, but I mean, I guess for me is that when you go back to classic Hollywood, it's very difficult for as a woman of color to kind of find those inspiring icons because, uh, you know, that we didn't quite have the same uh, representation back then. So like a lot of my kind of icons tend to come from like, um, you know, uh, more, more modern films. Um, but having said that, I do think that there is also a generational thing that has happened uh, recently where um, I think we view power a little bit differently when it comes to our girl bosses. And I'm wondering if it's as simple as kind of Obama era versus Trump era. of Like the idea of the boss itself has also kind of become a little bit more tainted in cinema. Like, you know, even to frame someone as a girl boss, you know, we're not talking about, you know, their passions or their identity, we're kind of talking about their power over the people underneath them. And like, is that something necessarily that we are, you know, as a culture aspiring to quite so much as we did just a few few decades ago when something like Working Girl was being made? And I think it raises a lot more kind of questions than it answers, unfortunately. But um, yeah. Ashanti, how about yourself? Like, as somebody who you know is immersed in cinema who has you know as you say been inspired by women in film for an incredibly long time how how about yourself have you kind of had women speak to you that have perhaps gone back even further than than our starting point there you know it it is always a real grasp and search for someone of color just like what Leila said we are not seeing that representation we've rarely seen it for me I almost feel like this whole idea of a fantastic girl boss started with the Mindy project because that's what I've seen in popular culture recently here's a woman who's a partner at her her surgery she's a doctor she's you know, she's an empowered woman. And we didn't see that kind of character, especially from South Asia or South Asian women in American cinema or in mainstream cinema as a whole. We just did not see that. But going back, you know, you have films like Mahogany, which is a, an old kind of music based film. And it's, uh, I only saw it because I was into Diana Ross. And that's going back to 1975, way before, you know, way, way before most of us were born. And that was a really, really interesting one because suddenly you saw this woman who wanted to become, she aspired to become something. She wanted to become a fashion designer and here she was. And Diana Ross was that woman a lot of us looked looked up to. And for me, I grew up in Nigeria and I used to watch Soul Train all the time. And for me, this was really big when I, when I saw that there was a film that depicted this. And someone like Spike Lee, for example, he, he hasn't, delved into this too much but you've got things like she's got to have it and there's a, a film called crooklyn where he he showcases this you know alpha woodard is, is is there she's a strict mother you're seeing women in these these roles and it's happening very slowly so we're talking 1975 then in 1994 so women of color haven't had their due in these roles as yet in television yes more more often so this new tv series called kung fu that's come out in the us it'll be hitting the uk soon that's got this girl who is, you know, she is so empowered. She does Kung Fu. She searches for her roots. There's a lot of girl boss moments in that that I loved. Or if you watch um, Aquafina is Nora from Queens. That's another one where you see this girl who's inherently shown as a slacker, but then she grows into a boss. And seeing that is great because we are not seeing that diversity and the representation enough. And it's great to be able to see it. I wanted to come back to uh, Mindy Kaling because I think a really wonderful recent and and positive, I think, but it's open for debate. I think a very positive take on the girl boss exists within, and and I I concur, I think Mindy Kaling is an incredible creator and writer and I'm I'm very excited to see her get her dues because she's doing such interesting work and and case in point is Late Night, which is a film in which she uh, co-stars with Emma Thompson 
Emma Thompson. She's recruited to come and write for a late night show, which are obviously very big in America, not so much in, in the UK, but she reaches out and she forms a working collaboration with Emma Thompson, who is a slightly out of touch girl boss. Again, she, she takes all the boxes. She's very kind of purse lipped. She's very assertive, you know, a wave of the hand and the whole room empties. But it shows how um, a woman comes in and is able, and she's a diversity hire. They don't, they don't kind of try and cover that up. She's very clearly a diversity hire. But she comes in and she starts to change the working environment through her collaboration with this woman. And I'd be really interested to hear your read on this because to me, this feels like a little bit of a shift, a hopeful. I like to call it a hopeful shuffle, like a hopeful shuffle in the right direction. But I'd be interested. Um, to hear your read on it, as I say, if I could start with you, Leila, for this. Yeah, I mean, I think these are some of like the most interesting narratives where we kind of have two female characters almost representing different waves of feminism, where it's kind of, you know, you've got the Emma Thompson character who sort of is more like, I suppose, third, um, third wave feminism and is kind of what I'd like to refer to as the Smurfette girl boss, which is like the one <laughs> who likes to be the only woman and nobody else can kind of come near her. And then kind of this kind of newer generation, fourth wave feminism coming in to be like, no, this isn't kind of how you have to do everything. You can kind of be more inclusive. You don't need to pull the ladder up behind you when you have your success. Um, and I think it's something that's being done really interestingly on a show called Hacks, which is just coming out now, which I'm absolutely obsessed with. But like, this is what we kind of need more for from films. We need to kind of have complicated female characters kind of, you know, allowing them each other to be complicated and, you know, then pulling each other up. I mean, that's what we also need in society. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Marianne, how did you read that film? Did you think it was a, do you echo what, what Layla says? Absolutely. And I think Mindy Kaling is amazing and I can't wait to see what she comes up with next. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about Late Night is that the Emma Thompson character is not wholly villainous at all. Mm -hmm. The movie makes a real point of showing how unusual it is for her to be the host of a late night TV show in America. I mean, in the film, she was the first woman to do it. And I don't think there's been one yet. Um, certainly not on that scale um, of a major network television can I, show. Can I interject uh, Lily Singh, who is Superwoman, you might know her Superwoman. She has, this is her second season, though she's moving away from it. She had the first woman of color in a late night show as a woman. Oh, and that's cool. Woman of color. But I loved what Emma Thompson did and what they, what Mindy Kaling did with that character and showed that sometimes there, were, there was a reason why the first woman in felt like she had to become one of the guys and not allow more women in. But that does change for the, for the character over the course of the movie. So, yeah, I, I really love that film. Amazing. I did want to touch on the role, the the bond that exists between a girl boss and a matriarch because I feel like that is something that we are starting to see slightly more in modern films I'm thinking of Jennifer Lopez and Hustlers as an example um who to me right now is the definitive girl boss but I'm also thinking of the characters in another a, a recent show called Pose especially Dominique Jackson who is the self-appointed uh, matriarch of this kind of self-made family which again borrows from from Hustlers in the same way it's self-made families and they have these self-made matriarchs who are also incredibly assertive businesswomen you know, they exist outside the law. We're not going to say the stuff they do is morally shady. But I think that is a really interesting development in that narrative as well. And again, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Shanti, if I could start with you. Uh, yeah, to totally agree. I, I think that this is shifting. So we were talking about Late Night. And since then, we have seen films like Like a Boss, which has, you know, Tiffany Haddish taking that role of a woman who owns a company. And we've seen a film like Little that came out, you know, in 2019. Again, this, this was, it was one of those where, you know, she, she's been bullied as a child. She wants to now, you know, she wants to become a boss. She's become a boss. And then what happens? And it's a fantasy film. And I don't think it did as well as it should have done. But I like the fact that Late Night has created these little spin-offs, I would say, and Hustlers and, and Girls Trip and all of these films are, are showing this, even in, well, in Horrible Bosses, we saw someone who, you know, Jennifer Aniston, there is an, um, a murky kind of girl boss, <laughs> you 
you know, but but she's there and she's assertive. And again, it's it's this idea of you have to blend in with the men you're working with. And having worked in the corporate world, I had to struggle with that a bit because if you weren't going out for smoking breaks and if you weren't going out to golf with the guys, you weren't you know you weren't considered part of that little little clan. And it stopped your you know for you to climb that ladder, you had to you know, you kept getting suppressed. And we're seeing, thankfully, I'm, I, I would like to think that we are seeing a change with all of this. We are seeing these empowered women who are able to get, get there. And they're not just women who come from lots of wealth. They're women who are working their way up and they really want to, to do something with, with their lives, with their companies and, and build it up. So I'd like to think this is, this is changing now. And I'd like to think that the more women who are writing these stories, the more we're going to see these stories appearing. And again, that gender gap is so huge in cinema. You know, yes, we're seeing one woman director being given a big film, but how many of those are being written by women and how many women are asserting themselves on, on that side of things? And how hard is it really to get that bankroll? That's the, the kind of bottom line with all of this. So I'd like to say that there is hope. And I think that this gender balance is slowly changing. I want to see it changing in my lifetime. And it's one of the biggest things I'm constantly campaigning for, because I feel like a lot of this starts at the writer's rooms. It starts at the commissioning processes. And yes, you might have a woman commissioner, but then if everyone else beneath her is, is, a, is a guy, then it's very hard for a woman who's writing to get that script passed. And this is where these big, these big issues happen and where we're not seeing that reflected as much on the big screen, but it is changing. Absolutely. Leila, how about yourself? Do you think that these, again, a positive or hopeful shuffle in that right, right direction, but do you think these small examples that we are starting to see manifest on screen are the result of, of a shift behind the camera as well? And, and are you hopeful that we'll see more? Do you think we should be seeing more examples like this? Yeah, I mean, I think of someone like Issa Rae with her show Insecure and I think the way you know she's a very successful person in that show um, her character but she shows kind of the complexity of what it is to be a woman in the workplace and and not kind of by bashing your head over uh, uh, bashing you over the head with it you know she's got a colleague in that show who's just a perfectly pleasant white guy and you just see him being handed stuff that he isn't and he doesn't have to try to the same extent yeah. so like it is you know, I think we do have to kind of take into account what the workplace asks of us and playing the game isn't necessarily all that we should want to do. Like I remember seeing um, a talk online that was from a kind of girl boss who I will not name. Um, and she was kind of talking about like, oh, you know, all that you have to do in order to succeed in these fields is to be better than the men, be better than these guys. And I was like, well, you are actually advocating for discrimination when you are telling me that I have to work 10 times as hard to get, you know, twice as, get to the same place as a man. So I think we have to be careful when we have these kind of models in cinema, like what is it that we're really looking at? Are we saying that it's okay for a woman to kind of burn herself out just to kind of get a pay rise? Are we saying that it's okay for you to have to sacrifice any work-life balance and that somehow is like an empowering thing? Like, sure, I mean, as Ashanti was saying, we want women to have like their voice at the table and to be heard and everything, but I think we have to stop before we're encouraging them to sacrifice too much. I think that's definitely true. Um, it occurs to me that there's no equivalent term for male characters to girl boss. We just let men be men on screen and they have, they have the full range of life and life experiences and some are good or bad or in the middle, but we haven't had to, or no one has decided we needed a word for this. Um, for this particular kind of guy, like if, if there's even an equivalent to a girl boss. And I think the fact that that is the case still shows how narrow the depictions of women on screen are. So hopefully, maybe we'll get to a point where we don't need to use the term girl, girl boss at all because they will just be this wide full range of, of women depicted on screen. Um, I'd like to think that that's the case anyway. With that in mind, I mean, we're, we're trying to move past the label of the girl boss, but I'm interested with the way that things are going, 
with the gradual hopeful shuffle what do you envision that a girl boss will look like on screen in say 10 years time if i start with you marianne there. oh yeah sorry um well, hopefully, um, as I think it was Layla was just saying, the um, there'll be a full depiction of you know women who aren't having to sacrifice their whole personal lives and their entire existence to a job. That would be very nice. Um, I think if we could see female characters who are authoritative but not villainous and respected for their authority, and that it's almost uncommented on, that there's no reason for anyone to even act like it's a strange or unusual that this woman is wielding power and commanding people of all genders on screen. That would be really nice. And it would be really great if we could see more girl bosses of color. Absolutely. Because the few, that, the few that we're seeing now are, have mostly been white, mm -hmm. apart from some of the, the a few that we've mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Overwhelmingly so. How about yourself, Ashanti? So I feel, I and I, I'm, I, I know I'm talking more about television than than films because in television, we are seeing this change. For me, I've seen something like the bold type, it's filled with flaws, can't take away from the flaws. But if you actually look at these women and look at what this, the whole traje tra trajectory of this series, the bold type really has worked for me just because I could see these women that I wanted to mirror. I could see these women who worked uh, in a magazine. I could see a boss who was this wonderful woman. You know, she. She went through her own kind of personal struggles. Yes, she put her magazine on top of her personal life, but you see her changing over time. You also see that she was a very, she was a wonderful boss. She empowered these women to actually go after their own dreams. And it's set around three characters. One of them is a mixed race African-American and the other two are white African-American. And you see these, these, these ladies go through so many things in their life. And I love that. I love to, I'd love to, love to see, it's like, like what Marianne said, it's to see these sort of women normalized in, in cinema broadly would make me feel really happy. And I don't know if any of you have seen Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, which, has run for a few seasons again tv series where you know this girl is a computer programmer you know she she works at this wonderful kind of san francisco company tech company and her boss is also played by a woman in the first C series and in the first episode you see her boss as this this one woman and you're just thinking yes I absolutely love the fact that there is a woman running this tech company though it's owned by a guy there's a woman running this and then this girl who plays Zoe she also comes in and she she as a character grows as somebody who is is a coder turned boss and I want to see this I want to see this because I've seen this in real life why not on 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 the big screen why not on the a small screen why should we only look at superhero films because we're always looking at oh my god Ms. Marvel has done it or Wonder Woman has done it and that that's great it's nice that they can kind of kick ass and fight but there's other fighting that's happening there's lots of activism that's going on and women in these roles have done it in in real life for, for so many years why not depict them on screen and this is what I want to see more of yeah, absolutely. And yourself, Leila, what do you what do you envision Girl Boss twenty thirty one to look like? Um, well, I mean, if they're still going to be bosses, I'm kind of picturing. I mean, obviously, I want women of color, non-binary people, and seeing way more of them on the screen. And I imagine that we're going to kind of have things a little bit more similar to like Shiv from Succession, and that might be just because the season three trailer got just came out, and I'm very very <laughs> excited for it. But like this idea of like complicated women, and yes, she looks fabulous, and yes, she. Um, you know, has a presence and she's someone that maybe you would want to get a glass of wine with, but like that, that greed, that sort of capitalistic drive is actually a really negative, <clears throat> is a really negative thing within that character. So it's like, oh, well, you know, where she could be a better person and be more considerate to her employees, like that would be great. But if we're going to have a villainous girl boss, let's have the capitalism be the villain <laughs> rather than the actual <laughs> femininity. Absolutely. It's interesting to see how people are reading um, new villains in these films where the, the girl boss was originally projected as the villain. I think a recent example, one that's certainly been on the internet a lot, is when you look at Miranda Priestly in um, The Devil Wears Prada and people are actually starting to 
to realize now that the real villain of the film is her boyfriend is Anna Hathaway's boyfriend in the film who doesn't support her and when you think about the narrative now and you see that Priestley you know is this nefarious caricature essentially but also bolsters this woman's career you know is at the top of her game she doesn't do it in the most healthy way but is you know a constant source of support for her whereas the boyfriend is this kind of sap and it's interesting to kind of to look back on these portrayals and actually see who the real villains are. I mean, with Shiv in succession, you know, the villain is her father. She's a product of the environment she's grown up in. And it's interesting. And, and as you say, you want capitalism to be the villain, but invariably it is this woman who has to shoulder this kind of responsibility of being the baddie because of her relationship with power. It's very, it's very interesting. Yeah, I have a weird relationship with the Miranda Priestley character because about um, eight years ago, a friend of mine did actually do that job. She was Anna Wintour's assistant for two oh. years. And, and it, it's it's abuse. It's the most horrific, abusive job in the world. There's nothing empowering about it. They don't pay you a living wage. So only wealthy people can kind of even have the opportunity to do it. And this is not something we should aspire to at all. <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of, you know, the me, for me, a moment where kind of the curtain was pulled back, where it's just like, oh, it's actually, you know, not fun to give people impossible tasks and then berate them when they can't complete them. Like this, this isn't really something that, um, yeah, should be kind of held up as any sort of wonderful thing. Okay, I retract that statement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> women can't catch a break. Um, but Some I, women can, just not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do like the point that we've raised today that it's about laying those steps for the next generations of women to come after them where it's not as you said Leila so beautifully like yanking up this uh, ladder it's about laying the steps and hopefully as I say and as I keep saying hopeful shuffle in the right direction and hopefully if we have this conversation in five ten years the girl boss I mean it says in the event description you know the rise and fall of the girl boss maybe the, the fall of the girl boss isn't such a bad thing and as you say, we will have just, you know, women co co-aligning with men in these these positions of power and it's not labeled. Um, yeah. I wondered if anyone had anything to add or anything they'd like to raise. From what yeah, I, I'd like to add, we're talking about Double Wears Prada, that's a 15 year old movie now. Mm -hmm. And the Anne Hathaway character in that, as far as I remember, doesn't really push back against what she's uh, facing in the job. She just kind of has to endure it because that's the job. <laughs> we were talking about Late Night where Mindy Kaling's character, uh, that's a much more recent film of course, and Mindy Kaling's character uh, does not accept the, the situation that she is thrust into and she tries to change it. Uh, and there's another TV show that uh, it's called Shrill starring Edie Bryant, which is, I don't think it's on TV in the UK yet. But it is, it's, it's on, on iPod. Oh, it is. Okay, cool. Um, and A.D. Bryant's character is another young woman who decides she does not want to put up with this toxic workplace. And she goes and does her own thing. She becomes a, a sort of a blogger and an independent writer. And there's a lot more going on on the show. But maybe that's one of the hopeful signs that now we're telling stories where, yeah, there are these horrible girl bosses, but the women, the younger women who are working for them are not accepting the rules that they're being handed and they're trying to change things. So that's, I think that's a really positive sign. And that's what's happening in Hacks as well. Yes. Exactly. I, haven't, I haven't seen Hacks. I'm going to have to check it out. Brilliant. Highly recommended. Mm. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, can, I, can I chip in quickly also? Of course you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, we're wrapping. I, I wanted to say that, you know, watching things like Self Made, for example, which is on Netflix at the moment, that, that's one again where you see Octavia Spencer and you see a Black woman. And this is something that we're just not seeing enough of. You're seeing this woman who turned into a, a mogul. You know, she knew uh, and found this fantastic thing that would help black hair and she went out and pursued it, you know, and everything was difficult for her. The odds were against her. Nobody was supporting her, but this woman did it and she was a self-made millionaire and that for me felt really good. And I remember watching Hidden Figures again, there were flaws in this, but the fact that the representation these women brought to the screen to show that there were women of color doing these things you know when even in india you know they sent a, a shuttle off to mars and they were the first to do it most of the women on that 
you know, most of the people who did it were women. It was a woman boss who was leading a team. And you, you saw them celebrating afterwards, all dressed up in their saris, looking absolutely glamorous and beautiful. It could have been a scene from a Bollywood film, but this was actually the, the space station that went to Mars. So there are people who are doing these. We're just not getting their stories out enough and getting them out into the mainstream. Because some of these things I'm talking about perhaps would be considered as very niche because they're not hitting the mainstream enough. They're only hitting the mainstream in, in, these big, in the big films and the, the superhero films where some of it is done in a very tokenistic way. And I'd like to see this done in a, in, in a much more organic way. Yeah, that is certainly something I, I loved self-made I don't think it nearly got enough um attention that it deserved it got quite buried by the algorithm but I think hopeful words from you Shanti but I do remember there being a criticism of self-made at the time was that they kind of slightly inaccurately to that character's life injected a, a female rival yeah. and that was not really the relationship that that person historically had with that person so it is interesting that even in uh, you know, a true story of a woman's ascent to power, we had to kind of put in some woman on woman aggression. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. I'd like to not see that in five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just take that out completely. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much to the three of you for joining me today. It's been a very, very invigorating and nourishing conversation. And I hope it's given the people who have watched this today plenty to think about. Um, I'd like to thank the BFI for organizing today. I hope people who are watching this are having a fantastic uh, weekend of, of doing this. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you all so much. So thank you, Marianne, Ashanti and Leila for joining me today. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.